Robert Stevens, and I would like to take you on a tour of some of the most fascinating and scenic regions in Southwest Australia. Torndurup National Park is one of the must-see places. It's located just south of Albany. It is named after the Aboriginal clan that lived in the area prior to the arrival of European colonists. The continents of Australia and Antarctica were bound together along this rugged coastline for one billion years. The rocks you see were left behind when the continents broke apart about 45 million years ago. The gap was formed mainly of gneiss, a rock created deep in the Earth's crust, driven by wind and waves from the Great Southern Ocean. Water and air pressure wore open the cracks, quarrying the granite into block-shaped sections. Sometime in the future, the gap will widen and disappear, and the natural bridge will collapse and become a new gap. Back in Albany, a port city that was the first settlement in Western Australia, with some lovely colonial architecture, including this town hall. We enjoyed our accommodation at Flinders Lodge with our American hostess, Rosie, who made us some scrumptious banana pancakes for breakfast. That morning, we visited one of Albany's unique landmarks, Dog Rock, which really does resemble a bloodhound. Of course, Dog Rock has its commercial tie-in. Many beaches surround Albany. One of the most pristine and protected is Little Beach, about a 30 minute drive away. The crystal clear waters are perfect for snorkeling and body surfing. Breaking away from the south coast, we zip up the Brand Highway with outback road trains whizzing by to our next destination, the Pinnacles. Let's visit the Pinnacles Desert, part of Nambong National Park a three-hour drive north of Perth, just off the coast of the Indian Ocean. This desert is filled with thousands of limestone pillars, some up to five meters, or 16 feet tall. The Pinnacles Desert is otherworldly. It is truly an only in Australia experience. When Europeans first discovered the pinnacles, they thought that the rock formations were ancient ruins. Over the years, exposure from rain and wind produced these vertical structures, composed of seashells and sand, which is the basis of limestone. While the formation of the pinnacles would have taken thousands of years, they were only exposed about 6,000 years ago, and then covered up by shifting sands, before being exposed again in the last few hundred years. The Aboriginal legend of the Pinnacles tells a different story. Legend is that an Aboriginal tribe used to inhabit this desert, but the tribe took too much from the land. As punishment, the gods killed the entire tribe. The individual pillars rising out of the sand symbolize the arms of the dead tribe, reaching up to the heavens, asking for forgiveness. Lancelin, two hours north of Perth, is one of the best places in Western Australia for windsurfing. Here, the Indian Ocean often serves up a stiff breeze. On our way to Fremantle, 
and Rottnest Island, we stopped at Leighton Beach to watch some surf lifesavers. Bathers and kite surfers. Fremantle, which is a 30-minute drive from Perth, is the closest port to Rottnest Island. The city has a wealth of colonial architecture, including these interesting details on the town hall. It also has an historic and lively market. A grassy esplanade. leading to the harbor and fishing boats, a waterfront restaurant, and a popular brewery, all of which were the stage for the 1987 America's Cup sailing races won by Australia. Our next destination is Rottnest Island, 18 kilometers or 11 miles from Fremantle. It is a wonderful getaway for day trippers or for people who want to stay the week. So on behalf of Rottnest Express, we're starting myself, thank you very much for playing with us. We hope you enjoyed that. Let's get much calmer than that. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day here or your stay on Rottnest Island. To get around Rottnest, you can walk, ride a bike, which can be hired or take your own, or use the public bus. We stood in the middle of the busiest spot on Rottnest Island, the commercial center of Thompson Bay. I would like to introduce you to a Rottnest Island native, the Koka, a small marsupial related to the kangaroo. There are currently about 5,000 Kokas on the island, which is one of the few places they can be found in Australia. The Dutch, who discovered the island in 1696, thought they looked like big rats, hence named the island Rottnest, meaning rat's nest. The average quokka weighs 3 kilos or 7 pounds. It eats plants, seeds, nuts, and insects because it's an herbivore. Quokkas breed once a year, have one baby a year, and mate from January to March. Looking at the map, the island is 11 kilometers or 6.8 miles long and 4.5 kilometers, or 2.8 miles, at its widest point. In addition to its many popular and lovely beaches, Rottnest offers a coral reef and excellent fishing grounds. Even though Rottnest Island is relatively close to the Perth metropolitan area, it feels worlds apart with its relaxed pace, epitomized by its cyclist. Three hours south of Perth, nestled in the trees above a spectacular coastline, is Yally Up. named after the local Aboriginal word for place of love. It is renowned for its surf breaks.
just down the road from Yelling Up, is Canal Rocks, a series of protruding rocks that features a main canal. It is a favorite for snorkelers, teens enjoying an impromptu diving platform, or just wanting to scale the rocks. The National Park Service has erected a series of elevated boardwalks to provide access to the main canal. Waves from the Indian Ocean have sculpted a patchwork of rocky islands. Inland from Canal Rocks is the town that gives the region its name, Margaret River. It is surrounded by many premium wineries, including the Voyager Estate. Pulling into the driveway, you first notice the huge flagpole, the formal gardens, then the immaculate vineyard rose. The red roses are not just decorative, but are planted at the end of each row of vines to show disease before the vines do. The Voyager Estate dates from 1991. Voyager offers a refined dining experience. We arrived too late in the day to have lunch, but we did have tea and a delicious chocolate cake. Due south from Voyager, is the Jewel Cave, one of a number of interesting caves found in the region. It's at the moment in a dry cycle. That means there is very little growth happening in the cave. There's not much water coming through the roof. Jewel Cave is home to a frozen waterfall and one of the world's longest straw stalactites to be found in any cave. Thirty minutes south of Jewel Cave, we came to Cape Lewin Lighthouse, the farthest southwest corner of the Australian continent. Plus, it was the farthest place we could travel to on Earth from our home in McLean, Virginia. So, when you're looking back this way, you'll see the uh, Southern Ocean on the right and the Indian Ocean on the left. All right, 39 metres, 176 steps to the top. We're going to get going up and check out the view. Now, each lighthouse has its own flash timing or flash signature. This one flashes every 7.5 seconds, okay? The one up the road has a completely different flash, different pattern of flash. The reason being is, if you're at sea and you see a flash from a lighthouse, you time the flash with your watch, okay, 7.5 seconds with 20 flashes. You look at your chart, on the chart it says lighthouse, 7.5 second flash, Cape Bullen. You then know where you are, you're not looking at the wrong lighthouse, you can't confuse the two. Okay, so that's an international system. Some places that have lots of fog, England, Germany, uh, France, places like that, they also have fog horns with a pattern. Okay, so. Still very much a working lighthouse. 23 major shipwrecks out there, 22 before the lighthouse was built and only one afterwards, so it is doing its job. Okay, we'll get outside and have a look around, have a look at the view. I was impressed by the ingenuity shown by the owner of this van. Cheaper than painting, and you don't have to clean it. Just up the coast from Cape Lewin Lighthouse, the lengthening shadows of a long summer day, we looked at the relic of the Hamlin Bay Jetty. We observed the friendly stingrays near the jetty and wandered down to get a closer look at them. The rays are attracted by the scraps that the fishermen throw back into the water. We found out later that the friendly and tame stingrays had no official protection. And a few weeks after our visit, Stumpy pictured here a barbless ray, a favorite among all the children on the beach, was killed by a young fisherman to the horror of the onlookers on the beach. It's a sad footnote. As dusk came, we headed into nearby Augusta for a tasty groper fish dinner at the local hotel restaurant. After dining, we strolled down the sloping lawn and enjoyed the view of the Blackwood River. Now let's visit Hillary's Boat Harbor, about an hour north of Perth. 
a popular destination that is the home of the Aquarium of Western Australia. The aquarium exhibits the amazing diversity found along Western Australia's 12,000 kilometer coastline. The Grey Nurse Shark is the most widely kept shark in public aquariums around the world due to its fairly large size, its adaptability to captivity, and its crooked, fierce-looking teeth. Stingrays are usually gentle and inquisitive fish, but will protect themselves with a stinging barb on their tail if they are disturbed or harassed. A ray's mouth, containing grinding plates, is located on its underbelly. Prey is sucked into the mouth, crushed and swallowed, while unwanted shell fragments are spat out through the ray's gill slits. Loggerheads have a slow growth rate and take between 30 and 50 years to mature. They can live to be over 100 years old. The main aquarium holds 3 million liters of seawater. The acrylic tunnel is 98 meters long and has a moving walkway. I've taken you along the coast, north and south. Now let's drive to the Great Southern Forest, 400 kilometers or 240 miles south of Perth. Our first stop will be near Walpole in the Valley of the Giants, the Treetop Walk. Treetop Walk in the Walpole Nornalup National Park is one of the most visited destinations in Southwest Australia. The walk takes you to a height of 40 meters or 131 feet. It is designed to sway a bit. To give you the sensation of actually standing on a branch at the top of one of these tall tingle trees. The walk also includes a boardwalk through the grove of old tingle trees known as the Ancient Empire. Some of the trees are up to 16 meters or 52 feet in circumference at the base and over 400 years old. Forest fires often act to hollow out the base of the trees, creating a large cavity After a restful night at the delightful, splendid wren bed and breakfast outside Pemberton, we spent the morning with a local bird watching guide, Peter Taylor. Known locally as the 28 parrot, because of its call. So allegedly it's calling 28. But this one now, Swan River honey eater. Oh, right. Which I think is a terrible name. <laughs> In addition to pointing out birds, Peter took us to the diamond tree, a famous fire lookout tree with a little hut at the top. The climb up is for the adventurous and fit. Still thinking about the unprotected status of the Hamlin Bay stingrays, we stopped for a break on our bird watching tour. We encountered the registered carer, Leslie Harrison, who devotes her life to the care of orphaned animals. And when I first moved to Northcliffe, I bought a tiny little Mardu that had no right to be alive. Its mother had been dead for four days. It was a hairless baby. Its mother had been dead four days before I found the babies. I found two dead, one still alive, but it only lasted 12 hours, but I saved the other one. <laughs> so suddenly I was a carer in big scale. And since then, everything that comes into a mansion up Pemberton or North Cliff deck comes to me. Yep. Bottle tip. It looks like you have four in the hand right now. Three birds and eight kangaroos in total. You have eight kangaroos in the hand? Yep. Well, last year it was 12 kangaroos and a wallaby. <laughs> Over that period, then you do know exactly how old they are. Otherwise, as I say, you can't really tell. I mean, I've got one little bloke in there that looks like a little tiny one, but in actual fact, he's you know, at least nine months old. He could be older than that, but he was a run. He was definitely a run. <laughs> this really actually in the pouch, but they stay with mum for a very long time yeah. after that, of how, course. How long do they stay with them? 18 months before they're weaned. Okay. Which That's is a long time. time. Yeah. So if you start getting a unfurred one, 
It's less than six months old. Mm. So you've got it for one hell of a long time. Mm. I mean, I have, I think I'm right in saying, I've had four nights that I haven't got up to feed kangaroos since June the year before last. Wow. That was including June the year before last. Yeah. And the only reason I got those four nights, I was still feeding kangaroos. But the year before's ones, I hadn't started the next year's supply. They started turning up just after that. But I was still feeding three of the year before's, but they, kept, they were outside, out in the bush. And they came in mostly, yes, mostly after dark, in which case I had to get up and feed them. But four nights in one week, they actually turned up just before dark, before I'd gone to bed. So, so I didn't actually have to get up those nights. <laughs> Do they start treating you as the mum? Oh, definitely. Very definitely. They soon know that I'm mum. And they look after me the same as I look after them. They're amazing. If a kangaroo is sick, you can guarantee one of the others will you know, curl up beside it. I slipped on the steps outside the pen last year. I've, I've had very, very bad sciatics, so I always, after that sort of thing, when I've jarred my back, I lie down for half an hour, and usually I can then carry on with what I was doing, whereas if I try and carry straight on, I usually do my back in. So I went and lay down, two minutes later there was two kangaroos curled up beside me. They'd seen me fall, Mum needs help. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was beautiful, but they came Makes rushing in. Well, yeah, it? but they came racing in and stayed with me the whole time I was lying down. Down the road from Pemberton is the charming riverside town of Denmark, famous for its bakery. The day we visited, you could hear the distinctive sound of Harleys crossing the bridge. And boaters enjoying a Sunday afternoon. Some under the watchful eye of their parents. Several miles outside Denmark is the popular swimming spot, Green's Pool, protected by large rocks from the waves of the Southern Ocean. It's time to show you Perth the capital of Western Australia, a city of over 1.7 million. One of the best vantage points in Perth is Kings Park, one of the largest city parks in the world. Located on the bluff high above the Swan River, Perth has a dynamic skyline. Most of the mining companies, unsurprisingly, have their headquarters here, since there are 270 active mines in Western Australia. The Explorer bus is a convenient way to see the sights in Perth, such as the Mint, St. Mary's Cathedral, and Swan Bells. We enjoyed many facets of the city, including the pleasantly warm, sunny weather, which breeds an active lifestyle. We also appreciated the lack of traffic. The scholars. The cyclist. And the picnickers in Kings Park. Close by central Perth, is the upscale neighborhood of Subieco, where we stayed at 8 Nicholson, a very comfortable boutique lodging. We were well taken care of by Cheryl, the owner. Since we were staying in Subieco, we chose to visit the Subi market on Saturday morning to sample the produce and pick up the vibe of the community.
Perth has many fine restaurants. We chose a local one on the Cranbrook Highway. Spoggy is our favorite. As we admired the beautiful skyline of Perth, we remembered our journey and the many spectacular sights we saw along the way. The national parks, the beautiful coastline, the tall trees, all the wonderful experiences we had. And we thought, this is a place we want to return to.